up out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place. It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went away from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron, and command the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Thus you shall bring water out of the rock for them. Thus you shall provide drink for the congregation and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Listen, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me to show my holiness before the eyes of the Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this assembly, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and by which he showed his holiness. So in reading this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this is a a wonderful weekend of uh, celebration, especially because in this weekend, uh, for many of us, one of the ways that we were able to uh, celebrate Independence Day was to watch the movie version of Hamilton that was put out on TV. Bonnie and I were able to watch it. We didn't see it before. I've actually been able to see it in New York City, which was just marvelous. And it is, I have to admit to you, a play that I've never enjoyed anything more than seeing. Uh, so many memorable lines. Uh, just, just like, like my country, country, I'm young and scrappy and hungry, and I'm not giving away my shot. Uh, or being in the room where it happens. Or it's not a moment, it's a movement. And of course, there's that one applause line that uh, everybody in the theater applauds to. Immigrants, we get the job done. Now, of course, uh, the Hamilton play is a play about the American Revolution and how uh, it gains us a joyous freedom. But also, it is a play that not only celebrates that, but also how those freedoms butt head with tragedies of sin and prideful mistakes. Uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, the author, uh, has a wonderful way in the play of of calling us to courage and to a dedication of the promises of America's liberties, but he does not neglect how such freedom cannot protect us from loss and brokenness, even so, and the hurt that is often left in the wake of selfish ambition and desire. One of the parts of the play that always gets me, and there are many parts that get me, but one that especially gets me comes at that beautiful moment in the play in which George Washington, who has been president for two terms, asks Hamilton to help him write what is his famous farewell address. Uh, I I, I don't know if it's necessarily the best part in the play for me, but it is kind of the part the play lifts up that's the best part of our national life. Because uh, George Washington, having presidential power, indeed having enough power that, as many wanted, he could have been the King George on this side of the pond, Washington, after two terms, voluntarily lets go of his presidency, of his power, of his control. In the words of the song that's sung about this, he wants to teach them how to say goodbye. And he says, if I say goodbye, the nation learns to move on. It outlives me when I'm gone. And then Miranda, or Manuel, weaves in the actual words of Washington's farewell address into the song, which I thought was just a, a wonderful kind of way of bringing that history alive to us. Though in reviewing the incidents of my administration, I am unconscious of 
intentional error. I am nevertheless too sensible of my defects not to think it probable that I might have committed many errors. I shall also carry with me the hope that my country will view them with indulgence and that after 45 years of my life dedicated to its service with an upright zeal, the faults of incompetent abilities will be consigned to oblivion as I myself soon to be in the mansions of rest. What this statement from Washington means to me is that America promise is coming alive in Washington's voluntary actions by resigning, by retiring, by putting himself under a term limit. Whatever you want to call it, he is saying that freedom, uh, there's a, that the freedom values the well-being and the gifts of others more than it does in keeping for oneself power and control that the freedom means valuing the well-being and the gifts of others more than retaining power and control for yourself. Washington is our example of that. Uh, and, and indeed, he is a flawed character. He is uh, sensible in his understanding that his defects, uh, he, he likely committed many errors. And that is so true, but uh, I, I Michelle, um, uh, Michelle Norris, I'm sorry, uh, a reporter for National Public Radio, who has, many of you have heard her voice on, on the news uh, uh, in, in the evening, uh, so wonder, such a wonderful voice. She wrote an article uh, last uh, week about Washington's ownership of 300 slaves, 300 slaves. Uh, 10 of whose names she wrote down in the article, but also said that as much as Washington gets credit for freeing the slaves at his death, that during his lifetime when he was in uh, Philadelphia and the government was there, he, uh, because Pennsylvania, a, a, a free state, had a law that anybody who was a slave for more than 45 days would have to be released. Uh, Washington would go back and forth to New Jersey with these same people so that he could keep them as slaves in his service. And worse still, of course, is that even though the United States became the first modern democracy, it did so only for white males. All men were seen as created equal unless they weren't of European descent or not a woman who, was not, who were not given equal status with men. That's why racism is called America's original sin. It is a violation of the divisiveness which the gospel sought to overcome. The exclusion and oppression, especially of African Americans, Native Americans, and other non-white peoples, as well as women. Uh, all these things were abomination in some sense to the very ideal that was expressed in the Declaration of Independence, in the creation of a nation of freedom and equality. Frederick Beekner said as, or Frederick Douglass, I'm sorry, said as much in his lead up to the Civil War when finding himself at a civil, at a July 4th celebration was asked if he did not rejoice with being in that place and, 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 and enjoying that liberty. And he said then that the independence Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness were fine and wonderful ideals, but that excluded him. And that has been our, our shortfall and the struggle that we have. There's a short video I want to show you that speaks to this. It's by the documentary filmmaker Ken Burns, and in it he is talking about the Statue of Liberty and in the process interviews uh, of wonderful and famous author James Baldwin. Take a look at it and see that kind of sense of the history of this time. What is liberty? Oh, wow. That's quite a question. It's not, um, I suppose almost nobody really asks himself that question. Well, I can always...
is quote the um, Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And the moment I do that, I'm in trouble again, because um, obviously I was not included in that, um, in that pronouncement, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, what is liberty? That's the great writer James Baldwin speaking to me for one of my earliest films, which I made on the Statue of Liberty. That question, what is liberty, was my very first question for him. And that interview, which we did in a classroom at Hampshire College, was one of the most memorable conversations I've ever been a part of. It taught me an indelible lesson. Our monuments, even those as revered as the Statue of Liberty, are representations of myth, not fact. And as we consider what role monuments play in our culture, it's the history, not the mythology, that we must remember. The Statue of Liberty was hand-built by French laborers in Paris. Italian immigrants built the pedestal in New York. And ordinary people, French and American, donated money to complete the construction. The colossal figure was to be the tallest structure in the Western Hemisphere the vision of one stubborn Frenchman, Frederick Auguste Bartholdi. Inspired by the recent abolition of slavery in the United States and fearful of the tyrannical rule of Napoleon III in France, the idea was to create an enormous work of art to celebrate democracy and use America as an example to restore liberty in France. On July 4, 1884, after nearly a decade of work, the completed statue was finally presented to the Minister of the United States. That same year, in New Orleans, Louisiana, a large crowd gathered in Tivoli Circle on George Washington's birthday to dedicate a new statue, a 60-foot marble column in the center of the city with a 16-foot tall bronze statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. During the 10 years in which the Statue of Liberty was constructed, 20 Confederate monuments were erected across the United States in places as large as New Orleans and Charleston, South Carolina, as small as towns like Quitman, Georgia and Mariana, Florida. And since then, hundreds more have been built, the most recent in 2015. These monuments were efforts to reimpose white supremacy and rewrite history. They are racism memorialized in our public spaces. When we look at the Statue of Liberty and think about the ideals it's meant to represent, we cannot forget the larger context in the country at the time. The Jim Crow era in the South was just beginning. The Chinese Exclusion Act, a piece of legislation explicitly barring any Chinese laborers from entering the country was in full swing and more than half the American population couldn't vote. And all of this leads back to my interview with James Baldwin. Just as the interview was ending, Baldwin took a long, thoughtful pause, looked back up into the camera, and said this. Liberty is the individual passion or will to be free. But this passion, this will, is always contradicted by the necessities of the state. Everywhere. Well, as long as we've heard of mankind, as long as we've heard of states. I don't know if it'll be like that forever. It, for a black American, for a black inhabitant of this country, the Statue of Liberty is simply, um, a very bitter joke, meaning nothing to us. Earlier in the film, many people explain how, to them, the Statue of Liberty is a beacon of hope, a reflection of our highest American ideals. And yet here, Baldwin's words form a searing counterbalance that even our most venerated monuments represent a mythology, 
While we may hope the statue represents our highest aspirations for what America can and should be, it can also be a reminder of where and how far we fall short. A very sad uh, tape, but uh, helpful, I think, to us. Three weeks ago when I planned this uh, sermon, it was going to be on a day in which in this evening uh, I was going to be a part of a clergy-led walk in Leesburg, and we were going to start by protesting the Lost Cause Monument in the courthouse yard. And our walk was going to then lead us to the memorial for Orrin Anderson, a 14-year-old young man who was from the area around Hamilton, our town of Hamilton, who was lynched because he scared a girl who was actually a friend of his by putting a paper sack over his head and yelling, boo! As Ken Burns tells us, the history of the statue is to be distinguished from the myth. The statue of the Confederate soldier, remembered as a patriot for Virginia for whom uh, he fought for in the Civil War, is the myth history of the statue put up in 1908, not right after the Civil War, in the Loudoun Courthouse Yard as a part of the movement of that lost cause that as a part of what it was doing, an effect of what it's doing, it could continue to keep African Americans in a subcategory of citizenship. Wonderfully, the daughters of the Confederacy who uh, had given the statue to the county uh, decided this week to uh, take it down themselves, basically, to remove it and put it someplace where they can save it as a historical uh, uh, indication of what happened in the past, uh, resolving an issue. And so there is no march today. There is no uh, anything really actually to do anymore. But I wanted to still point out to us that this lost cause narrative of the Confederacy has, has had a, a, a kind of a, a mythological effect that seems to be presented to us as history, but is, is not. The, the, the mythology is that there's an old-fashioned chivalry, that, that when uh, the South was, was defeated by the North in the Civil War uh, because of strength of numbers and factories in the North, uh, while the South had superior military skill and courage, uh, that this is a part of the mythology that is going with it, that it had a, a contribution to gender roles in the South of preserving uh, family honor and chivalrous traditions. Its ideology also, though, perpetuating racism and racist power structures that led to Jim Crow laws. It viewed the Civil War as a struggle that was primarily waged, it said, to defend states' rights and to uh, be against the Northern aggression. When even in Jefferson Davis's speech about the beginning of the Confederacy, he acknowledged that it was to preserve a white uh, level of uh, what is right and good with African Americans well down the list and that slavery was indeed a part of the reason for the fighting of the Civil War. This lost cause minimizes or completely denies the role of slavery and white supremacy in the outbreak and, and the buildup to the war. But white supremacy was at the center of the light, light, lost cause narrative. And indeed, you can just see that in the sense that here is a Confederate soldier placed right in front of the Hall of Justice for our county. To say that there is justice for some, but there's levels of justice maybe for some others, or a threat of punishment for those who uh, fall in the caste of person below. That's what I was going to be there to protest and to ask that a change come. Our book of Numbers today, the, the lesson is also about freedom, but also about how freedom isn't always fully realized. 
And you see this quite, com quite clearly in how the Israelites are complaining. They have the freedom, yes, indeed, but they'd rather be back in Egypt almost because they're going to die here. Actually, some of the other complaining they did uh, did point back to Egypt, but you still see in this reading that we had a menu as if it's from Magnolias or the West End. It's like, we had such wonderful things there, figs and pomegranates and all these wonderful meats and, and grains and we had abundance of water and you've led us out here to die, Moses. And Aaron. That's the complaining of the not grasping of the freedom that was given but there's actually a little bit more in the detail if you look at it. The reading started out with Miriam dying, the sister of Moses and Aaron, who had led the Israelites with lots of celebration and tambourine, tambourine playing and dancing. And she dies and Aaron and Moses are grieving her loss and that's when the people come to them with their complaint about not having water. And they are forgetting that these two brothers are in mourning. And according to the Jewish custom to sit siva, they are supposed to have seven days where their focus purely is on grieving the loss of their family member, which is a wonderful thing. But Moses and Aaron relent and they, they go and they speak to God and God reminds them of the staff that they have to use the staff as a kind of thing to rally everybody, everyone around. You know the staff, it was that thing that Moses hit on the ground and it became a snake and, and a way of demonstrating that before Pharaoh and his magicians. That it was the thing that Moses touched the water with so that it turned the Nile River turned into a sea of blood. That it was the, the thing that Moses held up over his hand when they wanted to cross the Red Sea and, and the waters parted and led them to freedom. That's the staff that he had with him. And God says, take the staff, let it be a rallying point, and, and take it to the rock. And, and in, in Israel, if you visit there and you've been down to the, the mountains below the hills where Jerusalem is, you'll know that if you hit a rock in a certain, a certain rock in a certain place, that water will come out because it is percolated down the mountain. And, and maybe Moses stood before that kind of rock. And God said, command, and the water will come out. But instead of commanding, Moses hits the rock. It's a way of acting with power. Maybe to kind of loosen up the water. Or maybe to show that I have a magic stick. And by the magic, I'm going to make this happen. Instead of just speaking. Instead of commanding the Lord's word. That is interesting, isn't it? That he had the opportunity not to display power, not to show a miracle, but just to say words. And maybe in some ways that's what we are about. Here in this moment of history where we are still grappling with that original sin of our country that is about not just slavery but race and racism, that the way forward is to listen, to hear voices long silenced as our brief statement of faith in the Presbyterian Church asks us to speak only when we've looked into our own hearts to find out the things that are not right there, that we're a part of, that privileges us if we are not a person of color, to see that and to see things with new eyes and then to have conversation, that we have a national conversation, and through that find a new purpose for our nation after having followed a lost cause. In August, we're going to have a time of uh, examining issues of race and trying to enter into a deeper sense of that conversation. We want to make it accessible so that everybody, no matter, uh, you know, not just a small part of the congregation participates, but everybody can participate. Because it is something, if we are really going to celebrate this uh, Independence Day weekend, that we need before us. That we need to find a way in which all people are understood as created equal and invited to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as a part of our national life. 
We're going to have our offering now. And in the offering, we invite you to uh, click on uh, our webpage and send in uh, a contribution. Uh, we really appreciate when, when you take the initiative to do that and to help support our ministry. It's summertime, and as usual in summertime, uh, the funds don't come in quite as, as readily. But we also do want to celebrate and give thanks and gratitude for those who continue to give on a regular basis. And we are actually doing quite well as a, as a congregation and able by that to extend our mission to uh, things like Loud and Hunger Relief and Community Coalition for Haiti to our Neighborhood Learning Center, which is also uh, having a, a kind of a financial a challenge in front of it. We want to be together as a church to do our ministries and you are making that happen by the gifts that you give. As we have time for this offering, maybe you want to send a check in. We're going to sing a song, and we're going to sing uh, what is the kind of uh, national anthem for the African-American.